welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, the other C, caring for your health during a pandemic. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. From the beginning, COVID-19 revealed health disparities that already existed in communities of color, disparities that put them most at risk for infection spread. During the nearly two years of combating COVID, lingering mistrust of the healthcare system slowed vaccinations, and fears about the pandemic led patients of color to delay or avoid medical care for diseases like cancer. Doctors are now alarmed by the high rate of advanced disease, especially among African Americans and Latinos. What is the long-term impact of the delayed care? Joining us remotely, Dr. Charles Anderson, President and Chief Executive Officer, the Dimmick Center in Roxbury. Dr. Naomi Koh, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Boston University School of Medicine and a medical oncologist at Boston Medical Center. Dr. Cecil R. Webster, Jr., an adult, adolescent, and child psychiatrist and psychotherapist. Mark Kennedy, Senior Program Manager in the Chronic Disease Prevention and Control Division at the Boston Public Health Commission. Welcome to you all. So I want to start this way. This is something you've heard me say many times, and you all probably know it. Um, if America catches a cold, we know black America is going to get pneumonia or death as a result. That's just an old saying. And it certainly seems to fit right in in this scenario when we talk about delayed health care against a context of already existing disparities. But what I want people to understand is what we mean about delay and the impact. And I'm going to start with you, uh, Dr. Anderson. Talk about a good example of what it looks like when the delay happens. And I know you mentioned glaucoma uh, to the producer of the show. I wish you would uh, talk about that. Sure, I think glaucoma is a great example. And when we think about what glaucoma is, at the end of the day, you have increased pressure in the eye. And that increased pressure in the eye impacts the optic nerve, which is the main nerve that's required to make sure that you can see out of that eye. And to increase pressure, the nerve gets damaged. Once it's damaged, there's nothing that you can do. To make sure that no one's experiencing that sort of damage, you need to be monitoring the pressure in the eye. Something as simple as delaying that for just several months, especially if you've now also run out of your medications, can lead someone to be in a position where they've permanently lost vision in that eye. And that's just, I think, a really concrete example. And we're talking, you got to remember, six months into this pandemic, 40% of people were delaying deferring care. Six months without that sort of screening and management can mean the difference between whether or not you can see or not. Uh, Dr. Naomi Coe, same question to you. Give me a good example about what it looks like, uh, the impact of it when you delay care. Yeah, that's it's. I really like the glaucoma example, and it, it works really for breast cancer as well, which is my specialty. And I think what we don't live in is a model of prevention in this country. We live in an episodic acute care model, and so doing all this preventative work isn't isn't where the value and cost is. You know that that we see here. I think when breast cancer, if you're able to get a screening mammogram, say or if you have access to a primary care doctor, then you, if you have a question or a symptom or something comes up, then someone will see you and you can get that taken care of earlier. However, if you don't, if you're not plugged into the system at all and something comes up and your life is already challenging, it can be really difficult to get the care that you need. And so, you know, people will put it off or they don't have time. And that delay in cancer care is, is deadly. And so if you don't get a cancer diagnosed earlier, then that delay really puts you at major risk. Mark Kennedy, you've seen a lot uh, with black men who smoke um, putting off care that really might mitigate uh, a situation around diabetes. Yes, I have, and um, I've had a lot of discussions recently about uh, peripheral artery disease, 
And if you think about what that is and who's most impacted by that, uh, it's people with diabetes that smoke. And when you look at that from a gender perspective, a lot more men are impacted by that than, than women. At the end of the day, as you look at um, care for diabetes, and we know, that, of course, there is uh, diabetes self-management. So we're lucky in this particular context that some of that is actually taking place at home. But we are certainly seeing um, a lot of toe and um, foot amputations that uh, are rising as a result of the topic that we're talking about here. And I think that this is one of several conditions and situations where the delay in care or the hesitancy for people to go back to get care uh, is causing some very significant issues. Now, uh, Dr. Cecil Webster, you and I have talked during the COVID period about the increase in mental health concerns. But one of the points you want to make clear is that there is a false division between mental and physical illness. And how does that play out when we talk about delayed care? Well, that's a great question, Kali. Um, we, we, we make these divisions between physical and mental health for a lot of reasons, mostly so we can get a better understanding of disease, like what is irritability? What is not feeling so motivated to take your kids to school? Uh, what's it like when you're not able to focus as well um, at work? Uh, but really, we have one brain. We, we have one body. Um, and the divisions between physical and mental health are you know, useful, but they're very interconnected. If you are stressed out, let's say, um, watching police violence on television, uh, we know that that could have impact on the mental health of Black Americans, for example, with uh, David Williams and his group uh, over at the Harvard Chan School. Um, so they're very intimately tied, uh, physical health and mental health. So I want to make it clear that, um, first of all, I, this study from the Washington Post and the New York University Langone Health Center, one in three Americans, that's of uh, any race, delayed care. So just to, so everybody has a context of how much delaying of care has happened during this period. But the highest risk groups were African-Americans and Latinos, as we said at the beginning. You know, African-Americans and Latinos care about their health, too. So let's talk about the reasons why the delay, uh, particularly when you all have just given great examples of what happens as the result of a delay. So I'm back to you, uh, Dr. Anderson. Why have so many uh, African-Americans and Latinos especially delayed care? Yeah, it, it just reminds us of the fragile backdrop um, of health and wellness. When you have other competing priorities that you're juggling and your attention and the energy required to deal with some of those other competing priorities becomes greater, like making sure that you've got food on the table, stable housing, um, you're in and out of the hospital visiting family members or trying to get in and out of the hospital dealing with family members who are dealing with this awful disease. I mean, we gotta remember there's a whole population that as you say, uh, the reason why once part of the population is more likely to get pneumonia when everyone else has a cold is because of not having that, uh, that really inalienable right as far as I'm concerned to have the same sort of resiliency. And uh, I think that's a huge component of this. Dr. Coe, you've talked uh, very specifically about the black women who end up in your care at an advanced stage of cancer, breast cancer specifically, who say, I got to take care of my parents. I got to have all these other things. Uh, what some uh, research scientists like yourself call social determinants of health are weighing in on decisions about their own health care. Please explain. Of course. I mean, I, I see so many women who have told me, I, I can't believe this is cancer. I, I can't believe it. I just, I didn't realize that. Like, oh my God. And they feel so terrible about it. And what I think we, we unravel in our encounters is that they're busy. These women are taking care of kids. They're taking care of parents. They are doing wage jobs at times where they're working, you know, hours Monday through Friday. They don't have time off. They can't take that time off. So then when something like they feel something or there's a mass that's growing, they're like, eh, nah, like they're in denial because it's so much easier to say, 
it's nothing. I'm not going to worry about it. Or, or, or just that, that fear and denial are just so great in their minds. And then they finally take that extra time to then they have to find a primary care doctor or get themselves insurance. Or if they don't speak English, it's really hard to navigate that system. And it ends up getting to the point where, unfortunately, many of our diagnoses have come through the emergency room, mm. literally the emergency room. They show up there. And it's just like the doctors there know what to do at BMC. They, they give them appointments the very next day in our breast center and say, you have to show up tomorrow. Sometimes if there's availability, we will see them the same day. But it's a really big tragedy. And how we fix that is way beyond, you know, often what we can do in just the hospitals alone. This is a societal problem. And the delays for these women, they occurred before COVID, mm -hmm. you know, but now with the pandemic, I, I mean, now it's incumbent upon us to really make a difference and really make a change. And Mark, I want to pick up uh, from what Dr. Coe has just said. Some of this fear existed before COVID. But a lot of it has been exacerbated, as I said, as these health disparities have become revealed during this period of time. And the fear has grown, actually. So you're talking about people who are at home suffering rather than deal with a system that has not interacted well with them in the past. You're absolutely right. And, you know, the, the issues of um, cultural inconcordancy and language inconcordancy, if you will, have certainly existed long before uh, the pandemic. Um, so people that weren't having good uh, substantive uh, relationships and experiences with their doctor pre-COVID aren't going to rush to the doctor during COVID or after COVID. So we know that that's uh, certainly the case. The other point though that I want to bring up is the fact that there's um, at least some level, if not a deeper disconnect than I even imagined between an association with symptoms or some tangible manifestation that there's something wrong versus the fact that I don't feel anything, so I don't really think I need to go to the doctor. You exacerbate the need to work under the conditions of COVID because so many people are losing jobs and people are feeling more pressure to take care of their family. So at that point, if you don't feel like there's something wrong, you're doubling down on taking care of yourself and your family. You have that, you have that issue in addition. When you talk about people not uh, seeking care, we know that some of the things that impact people of color most, uh, diabetes, a, a, a lot of hypertension, a lot of cancers are not symptomatic until it's late in the game, okay? When, when men talk about conditions that impact them with their friends, and I know I'm guilty of this, when I talk about something, I generally use language like, well, that was bad enough for me not to be able to go to work. Mm -hmm. I talk about those things in the context of my ability to work. Mm -hmm. And if I don't think that my ability to work is compromised, I'm going to continue to go to work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to not seek the preventive care that Dr. Cole was talking about because I don't know that I need it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we have uh, late stage diagnoses of a lot of things. It could have been prevented with a more preventive mentality as opposed to more of a reactive mentality. And um, uh, Dr. Webster, I want to pick up something else that becomes a piece of this as well. So we have the fear. We have uh, a lot of concerns of historic kind of bad treatment. But as you point out, the system is set up to pay for interventions that are seemed medically uh, necessary. So. If somebody can tell that you have a blockage, for example, a heart blockage, okay, we're going to pay for that, and maybe they can, you can be persuaded to leave your job and go in and check it out. But if your mental health is uh, worse than it was 10 years ago when you first got depression, nobody sees that until we're way past uh, a point of, of a good intervention for you, what makes it harder in, for your job. So talk about that a little bit. Yes, well, I, I first I wanted to I want to acknowledge uh, that there are some there are great systemic inequities and in resources. Obviously, many people are faced with economic constraints. They need to work. They need to support their families. 
Um, and of course, the things that are tangible, the things that we can see, things that we can notice are a lot easier. And, and also we have got a, a system of health that's really based more on healthcare, delivering interventions, rather than thinking holistically about prevention, um, like Dr. Koh was mentioning earlier today. Um, there's another component to this as well, uh, which is a psychological piece where um, actually, as Dr. Koh was mentioning before, denial and fear. When we have fear of our own vulnerability, we tend to turn down our ability to really look at in deep ways, um, uh, weigh out risks and benefits of uh, getting care, not getting care, understanding what the impact is, for example, particularly on African-American men or let's say black women or adolescents, those parts of our brains tend to shut down. Um, and when we have that fear, have that anxiety, we, we, we do our best to sort of put that aside uh, to, to deny it. So it might be like, well, I might feel some chest pain, but you know what? I'm not. I'm not even going to think about that. I'm, I just need to get through my day. I need to like make sure I pay my bills. I need to make sure I pick up my grandmother. I need to make sure that I uh, get my kids from school. So uh, we don't do very well with vulnerability, and so we we tend to look away from the things that are like early clues that something might not be quite right. So one of the solutions to intervention during this period um, for everybody, but particularly now as we're talking about folks ended up in advanced stages of delayed care, has been telehealth, telemedicine. But each of you have, you, you think it's a good tool, but you have some issues. Uh, chief among them, Dr. Anderson, is equity for you. Absolutely. And, you know, I think looking at all of this through that lens of equity is really important. I mean, there's a lot of lessons that we've learned through the pandemic. And, you know, as we talked about even in this last segment, just really understanding that when we talk about these social determinants, it's really this backdrop of inequity that makes someone less, or makes someone more vulnerable than someone else when you have a situation like a pandemic, right? That's really, I think that's the light that's been shown on this. And now we start to think about these technologies like telemedicine, which on its surface sound fantastic and for many have been incredibly valuable. But if you don't have broadband access, if you're sharing a phone between yourself and your child who's trying to also deal with education now that's delivered through that same mechanism, how, how are you having the same experience as someone who's sitting in their home with uh, great broadband access and multiple computers and all the sorts of things? If you think about that at baseline, there is a system that allows different individuals to have different views of the game, so to speak. There's individuals who are gonna be completely left out of the benefits of this sort of technology. If we're not able to look at this and understand that we're gonna to have to change some fundamental components of the system through a very intentional mechanism to make sure that there is equity. And I think we're at the opportunity, we have the opportunity to be on the right side of this now. We know what it is. Many of us have known it for a very long time, but now the light's shining on it. What are we going to do? And telemedicine's a great example, great benefit, but how do we make sure that everyone has access? Uh, Mark, would you follow up on that? What's, this, what's your feeling about telemedicine, telehealth? Well, um, it, it's similar, and um, it actually exacerbates some of the other types of messaging that we've heard through the COVID phenomenon that really falls into the exact same category that Dr. Anderson is talking about. But first of all, again, you, you, you have to understand who we're talking to when we say this. And my point is this, at the beginning of, of the pandemic, everybody was talking about, okay, if, you, if there's no reason to go out stay home because that's the safest place for you to be, assuming that you have spacing advantages and things of that nature. When you look at the high cost of living in Boston, and you're talking about multi-generational families, you're talking about uh, people that need to have roommates in order to afford the high levels of rent. There's a lot of people that live in two, three, four thousand square foot homes that have a lot of ways to space themselves out. And a lot of people that just don't. Okay. So the stay at home order, as it were, is a whole lot different depending on who you are, where you live, and how much space you have. 
Same thing with telemedicine and the mechanisms that allow you to have access to internet. If you're sharing those things or if you're experiencing those things differently, it's a whole different phenomenon. So again, it's a great advantage to some, not so much to others. And I think that's consistent with a lot of other things that we've been hearing about in terms of aspects of this experience, because it's not just the situational piece. How do people experience this? It's this fundamental difference between public health and population health, where you talk about certain segments of a population that are experiencing the phenomena very differently than others. And I think Dr. Anderson makes a great point in that regard. Well, Dr. Coe, you're just not at all a fan, it seems. <laughs> Oh, I hate to say I'm not a fan. I, I think there are some positives for sure. Um, I am not a fan because in my work, I feel that the pressure is on us as doctors and our, the, our hospital system to earn the trust of our patients that we care for. And at Boston Medical Center, we care for a lot of the black and brown community in the city of Boston. So I've always felt that it's it's on us to earn that trust back from these patients. That's a hard thing to do over the phone. Um, I think a lot of what we do in our encounters where, where I am is to show our warmth and our ability to listen. And, and so much of communication is not verbal. It, it's your body language and your tone. And we've got patients that don't speak English and trying to do a sensitive and very, you know, thoughtful conversation with a non-English speaker, you know, through an interpreter over a telephone, there are challenges there. Um, and so I just feel that, you know, depends on the patient. I've got some patients who I just love using um, the televisits for. It works beautifully. Patients that, that are traveling to come see us, and now I, we can just call them and be able to, you know, account for our time, you know, and talking with them before we do that anyway. And it wasn't part of any of our time um, that we we're accounted for. So there, there's definitely some positives, but I do think we need to be cautious of where there may be some unintended consequences that could be really harmful, in fact, for some patients. And we should be thoughtful about it. Uh, Dr. Repster, from the beginning, you telehealth has been a big part of how you've communicated with some of your patients, but you too have worried about missing some things um, as you're trying to counsel. Absolutely. It, it's been very mixed. Um, I will say that many of my patients uh, say that it's wildly convenient. They don't have to get in the car. They don't have to sit in traffic. They don't have to find parking. Um, they don't have to take that time out of their day. Um, and it can be really quite reliable in the sense that people do have good internet access, access to like broadband connections and uh, desktop computers and their iPhone and all those things. It can be wonderful in that sense. And there are also things that um, we we don't get to see as much. Uh, when um, you know, I've got uh, this one young man, for example, that I've seen for a very long time, but it had been um, a month or so before I realized that he had a boot. Uh, because he had an ankle injury uh, playing a sport recently. That's the sort of thing that I would be easily able to see and observe um, if you were coming into my waiting room, for example, but that I wouldn't have any clue about uh, just seeing his, uh, you know, his torso and his face on a screen. And that, might have some, the, and that might have something to do with the conversation you're having, as a matter of fact. That's, Absolutely. If he's having difficulty at work, getting around and feeling frustrated with that, that might have some implications for his general mental health, well-being, his adaptability. Um, but it's also really nice to see people's homes. They get to meet pets, they get to meet spouses. Um, but also conversely, uh, that means that there's probably not as much privacy uh, to be able to discuss some things that might be really close to heart. So just a quick round robin from all of you. Does this situation of delay, with particular emphasis on communities of color, get worse for the time being? Uh, when do you see it breaking? Mark, get worse? Well, I, I think it's going to continue to get worse as it begins to get better. I think that um, we've been engaged in some back to screening um, sort of uh, messaging to the city, uh, building on things that I'm sure we've all seen from organizations like the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, uh, South Shore Health, 
uh, trying to get people to come back into the system. And I think some of the numbers are suggesting that it has worked okay. to some degree. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that we are probably going to be looking at some to preach, uh, I'm sorry, uh, some, some substantive level of people coming back, but I think we're still sort of uh, in, the, in the slow uh, upward side of that bell curve. Okay, Dr. Anderson? I say it gets better. And the reason why I say it gets better is because we're actively engaging. Uh, we are actively on our campus, for example, reaching out to the 19,000 lives that we serve. And we're looking at this through that sort of lens. It's very often when you're in a position like this, that you start rethinking how you do what you do. And we are rethinking how we do our level of community engagement and not just relying on the trusted relationship that we have over 150 years being where we are situated in Roxbury. So it gets better because we're working to make it better. Dr. Cole, you have 30 seconds. Um, I think it gets worse acutely. And I think if we do it right, we're gonna, it's gonna get better in the long run, but it's gonna take efforts like these, being on basic black, getting the word out and supporting each other in the bigger work that needs to get done. Uh, you have 10 seconds, uh, Dr. Webster. It'll be uneven. For those that have resources, it'll continue to get better more quickly. And for those that have historically been left out, it'll, it'll be more difficult and perhaps lag behind. All right, thank you all. That's the end of our broadcast, end of the show. Thanks to all of the guests and thank you for joining us. Stay with us as we continue our conversation online on our digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. We are on Facebook and YouTube with our post show, continuing our discussion on caring for your health during COVID-19. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, I don't know if you all are paying attention to pop culture and its influence, but we've had some well-known deaths uh, which are known to be treatable if one gets um, attention earlier or can be deadly if not. And uh, we've seen it come up twice now uh, in the headlines. One is Chadwick Boseman. Uh, this is not to suggest that he delayed care, but just to, just to point out that it's one of those that one could easily de delay care on, and it's something that impacts African Americans uh, in a big way. Same thing with Greg Leakes. That may be a name of people who watch reality television. He's the husband of the Real Housewives of Atlanta star Nene Leakes, and he also died of colon cancer uh, recently. So do those stories um, that get out impact in a way to the, the people, the populations that you are seeing that, wow, this is real, and, you know, maybe by my attending to what I think is just something I can ignore because I have to go to work or it's not that big a deal or whatever, that does it make an impression um, in a way that maybe some of the regular kinds of messaging does not? I'll start with you, Dr. Koh. Um, I think it does and it doesn't. <laughs> I think it does for people who take that story, that, that person who, who they know and relate to and think to themselves, man, I'm going to do something positive with that. I'm going to get a doctor. I'm going to think about colon cancer screening, get some more information. That's great. I, I think there are people out there who can, who can see that story and go, oh, there, there it is again. Just, you know, people dying of this and, and there's nothing you can do. It'll happen to happen to anybody. So what's the point? You know, why would I bother? Like, I think that there can be a lot of different messages that come through. And I think what's really important for us, you know, as public health servants, all of us here today is to make sure that we're keeping up the message that it's actually about prevention. It's about getting connected in to healthcare. It's about seeing a doctor, a trusted doctor, and advocating for yourself and advocating for the symptoms that you have. Um, and I do think this might be an opportunity to talk a little bit about how we do know that there are these, you know, unconscious biases, and I just call them like racism that does occur when Black patients may come in and they just don't feel heard. 
Mm-hmm. They'll be like, you know, I said I, I had this pain or I said I, I had this issue and it, it wasn't taken seriously. Mm-hmm. I, I wasn't given the, the things I needed or the tests that I thought needed to be run. And, and I don't know if that's what happened to Mr. Bozeman or to anyone, but that does concern me quite a bit. And I think that needs to be talked about. That needs to be addressed. We need to talk about making sure we hear our patients and we take them absolutely seriously and reflect on our own unconscious biases. And the reason also, the other point of that is, these were two men who had real good resources. Uh, So if we're talking about people who have a lot of access uh, to resources and yet, you know, some messaging may or may not have gotten through, that is of concern. And the other thing, Dr. Anderson, that you keep emphasizing is that so many of these diseases that we're talking about being delayed are treatable. And uh, I think sometimes people think, well, it's, you know, if I get it, it's over anyway, so I don't, I don't know, worry about it. But, but if, if people could understand that that preventative piece, that early piece, is so important because pre- pre- preventable is the key word here. Uh, Absolutely. Preventable is the key word. It's that knowledge that there's something that can be done that often allows someone to look at that condition very differently. And, you know, a lot of this just comes down to me. It's it's really how do we actually influence behavior, right? And one of the things that I always appreciate from marketers when they talk about this is it often requires multiple impressions, Mm. right? Multiple messages, But more importantly, the structure and who is delivering the message becomes incredibly important, right? So I think for many of these things, it's how do we take these unfortunate situations with really public figures and how do we take the messages from that, get it to the right messengers and make sure it's delivered. But each of these to me become opportunities for yet another impression another impression that is going to now have somebody at that moment having seen and heard about it so many times in a way that they can relate to, it's going to make them make a different decision that day. And that is incumbent upon us um, as, as healthcare professionals, as those who are in this field, really looking to make a difference in this, in this, in this world in this way. We've got to be realistic about the fact that this is going to take multiple impressions and let's use every opportunity possible to be able to do that. Um, Dr. Webster, I mentioned uh, colon cancer and Chadwick Boseman and, and Greg Leakes, but in your field of mental health, there's actually been, for folks of color, I would say a bunch of folk who've come out recently of some note uh, to say, this is real, it's happening, I hit it, or I didn't want to talk about it, or I was uncomfortable, and here's the result. I'm thinking about Taraji P. Henderson, who started her own site, for example. I'm thinking about all these other athletes, and you know that's not considered, particularly the male athletes, that's not considered um, masculine at all to say, I'm having a problem. But yet they've come forth. What's been the impact in your arena? Because picking up on what Dr. Anderson says, multiple messages from certain messengers makes a difference. It absolutely does. Um, those messages tend to ripple out to, to people. And they, and I, in my own practice, I, I feel like I get more calls from people that have had a much lower bar for reaching out. Uh, they don't wait until they have problems at work. They don't wait until there's a difficulty in their marriage or the relationship with their children. Um, they don't wait until there's some sort of financial crunch. Um, they they intervene, intervene a bit more early. Um, they, they see these messages out there. They, they hear about these athletes. They hear about these politicians and others that have come out um, describing their own experiences with mental health. Um, and they often look for people, at least uh, particularly in my case, uh, look for people that might be able to understand their story, uh, might feel competent in discussing things easily and freely. Um, somebody that's not necessarily going to hear their experience of a, a, like a racist remark at work or at school and not have to like hold it up to the light and say, well, was that, was that really racist? Versus just listening and understanding where people are coming from and its impact on their overall health and well-being. Uh, so I think it's really quite powerful and it's, it's a beautiful thing to see, especially younger generations feeling much more comfortable discussing and advocating for their general mental well-being. So, Mark, you were already talking about some messaging that's going on um, in your division that you are that you all are supporting, um, with a particular emphasis in Roxbury. Exactly what what kind of messages are you 
um, putting out there now and what what impact uh, do you hope they will be having? Uh, thank you, Kelly, for that question. Um, I'm actually going to start off with my response by sort of piggybacking on something that Dr. Anderson said a second ago about prevention. I think there is a fine line between prevention and early detection as you move along the continuum mm -hmm. of the way a disease advances. Um, talking about helping you not get a disease in the first place versus helping you understand if you have it, but we can intervene for you have a really poor outcome in terms of extreme morbidity or God forbid mortality. Our messaging is, particularly the pieces that I'm working on, really are less skewed toward prevention because I focus on adults and in the early detection space. There's another dichotomy here as well, and that's the difference between the way that the guidelines are structured, which actually is more skewed toward people at average risk versus high risk, skewed more toward people that, again, to Dr. Webster's point, it's the people that are well, but they're worried enough to go get themselves checked out, right? We're trying to reach high risk populations, okay? We want to give people, and again, as, as Dr. Anderson mentioned before, who's delivering the message? Our approach is we want people to see someone that looks like them. We want people to see someone that is concordant with them culturally. So basically, my buddy next door is the face of a campaign and I can relate to that because we're both from the same community. We're part of the same culture. We eat the same foods. We have the same activities on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's like my friends talking to me and I can actually relate to that a, a, a whole lot better. The other piece that I'll wrap up with uh, is this. When you look at guidelines, particularly screening guidelines, you're talking about, again, as I mentioned, well, people are people at average risk, but they're skewed towards data. Think about the US Preventive Services Task Force. Those guidelines are pretty strictly based on data that says we looked at a certain number or a certain part of the population, and here's where we think the screening makes the most sense. Well, the people that are at the highest levels of risk are typically not included in that data gathering process. Um, I do a lot of work in the prostate cancer space, right? And the, uh, the data that led to the guideline about uh, PSA use for the early detection of prostate cancer had an accrual of men of color of less than 4%. And we know that black men are diagnosed 60% more often and die almost three times as often. So the task force says start at age 55. Most black men present with prostate cancer at younger ages and with more aggressive disease. By the time they get to 55, it's already late in the game, okay? We have a lot of things that we need to shift to make sure that this isn't just about data, it's also about equity. And when you balance the two in the system, you understand, yes, the data says this, but if I am at a community health center whose patient population is mostly black or Latino, I have to understand that in order for my patients to come out of this system with their optimal health, I may need to do something a little bit differently because of the patient population. And that's the messaging that we're trying to be engaged in. We want people to lean in to early detection, not to be told about what they should do. I think this should be a part of, if this is the way I live, how do I now how do I now fit this into my agenda? And I think that it's very doable and we're looking at crafting messages around that. Well, thank you for emphasizing the difference between uh, prevention and early detection. I think that's really important. I also want to point out that some of these studies that have been done, the one that I mentioned about Washington Post and the New York uh, University Langone Health Center, because some people may be thinking that this conversation really involves seniors. <laughs> these are non-elderly people. So we need folks to understand we're talking about non-elderly people and their highest risk, one of the highest risk was low income folks of color. So just wanna, so all the points that you hit there is exactly where they live. And then now back to you, Dr. Ko, cause you've been screaming from the high heavens about lack of folks of color in these trials. 
upon which people are drawing conclusions about diagnosis and treatment and prevention and all the rest. Um, talk about why it is important. First of all, you can also talk about the low numbers, as you know it to be, of folks of color in these very important trials. Yeah. I mean, I'll just start by saying as a medical oncologist with a specialist in, specialty in breast cancer, we have a lot of data. And we like to say that we're a very evidence-based you know, practice or field. Unfortunately, very early in my career, it, it kept coming up. Well, there are no Black women enrolled in these trials. There, you know, there are no Black women enrolled in these trials. Like, how can I take this data and really extrapolate that to the women I see? Because I don't know if that really would make sense for them. And as yeah. Mark Kennedy said so beautifully, it, it really is about equity and in, in how we think about the risk for different populations. And it's been something that's that I it, it keeps me up at night because I worry that should I be giving cytotoxic chemotherapy more to my black patients, knowing that the Oncotype DX score may not accurately reflect what's best for Black women. You know, that's come out, you know, in some recent literature and more evidence to support that. And it is terrifying. And so it's in that concern that we're starting a huge push. And, and, and I think a lot of centers are to get clinical trial enrollment of minority populations. And in cancer clinical trials, it is abominable. The numbers are in the single digit percents, if even lucky to have that many, you know, black men and women enrolling on these cancer clinical trials. And what's worse is that as we become more about precision medicine, everyone talks about how great that precision medicine is. Well, it's not gonna be great if we aren't getting those, you know, communities of color onto the trials so that we can understand what's precise about them. Because then we're extrapolating precision medicine, you know, from populations, white populations that that wouldn't really, you know, relate to black populations. That that to me makes me feel that the cancer disparities is going to grow. Mm. And we can't have that. We cannot have that. So we have got to get black and brown patients of color to donate biospecimens for research because that is what we need. We need them at the table. And that is what we're working really hard, you know, at doing in, in my group that um, I'm just, I feel really passionately about that. Dr. Anderson, would you like to add? Yeah, I, I would, you know, strongly agree with all of that. I think this is where though it's really important that we really look at it through this lens of equity. That makes tremendous sense, but you have to understand you can't approach black and brown populations the same way you're approaching white populations to recruit them into research. You have to take into account the historical context and not even just historical, the day-to-day -day context of just experiences of discrimination, which allows someone to not think about things the same way as someone who doesn't have that same lived experience thinks about things. So I think this is exactly when we talk about equity as being different from equality, right? Equity really is about what's the right size box that I have to give someone to stand on so they have the same view of the game. Ideally, we get to the point where the fence isn't even there and everybody can see it from whatever box they're on. But when we understand there's a fence, how do we make sure we're looking at this through this lens of equity? We have this outcome measure that we want, which is that equal participation in these trials. But to get to that, we have to address the barriers in a way that acknowledges the solution is going to require us doing something different in this population than this population to create real equity. Last word, Dr. Webster. Uh, I think everyone is describing a real tension uh, between this need to engage with important populations, peoples of color, uh, um, and understanding how we offer sort of general guidelines um, to our population. And on the other side, we don't have to look very far or very deeply to look at historical inequities and understand the um, skepticism that people might have when it comes to healthcare systems. Um, you know, we, we have things like uh, Henrietta Lacks with her cervical cancer um, 
without her permission, people took those cells and it's been used really widely for very basic research for, for a very long time, decades. Uh, and then on the other side of it, we have people like Serena Williams with her experience of giving birth, having some chest pain, advocating for herself uh, vigorously, like I, there's something wrong. And it turns out it could have been a life-threatening pulmonary embolism. So people have a lot of reasons to be skeptical. And much of Dr. Anderson's point of, um, of equity, being able to look at all of those different layers, how they impact how and why people are involved or not involved with clinical trial trials or very basic healthcare is, is, is so vitally important. Well, like, what is that? Thank you all for this very insightful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us.